After is John Mellinger, who will discuss endoscopic practice, how to uh, start getting privileges and your practice set up. Thank you very much, Debbie and Klaus. Thank you for the opportunity to be uh, part of this panel. And uh, I hope this will be a rubber meets the road kind of uh, presentation for some of you. I have nothing to disclose. Uh, getting all this new information and getting some excitement and enthusiasm about what might be possible in our practices from an endoscopic point of view is a heady experience, but then sometimes coming back to reality and the daunting nature of what it means to go back and become privileged and credentialed to actually apply these things in our practices uh, is a little bit perhaps like um, Mr. Churchill's experience with Lady Astor and she told him that uh, if she were his wife she would give him poison and he said, Madame, if I were your husband I would take it. So perhaps uh, we need to spend a little time as part of this course talking about the mechanics of how you would actually get to the point of applying these things in your practice. I wanted to just briefly review the fundamentals of privileging and credentialing and specifically as it pertains to the issue of flexible endoscopy as background information for those of you who may be contemplating making this a bigger part of your practice profile. As we all know, privileging and credentialing are local things. All politics are local, all privileging and credentialing are local, so there are always institutional nuances that you need to be sensitive to. Having understood that, uh, the standard procedure that most credentialing committees will go by is to look for evidence of proficiency in whatever the procedure is that you're wanting to, to pursue. And this can come through a couple different pathways. Typically, they want someone who has responsibility for having observed and documented your skill to come to the table and, and uh, advocate for that. And that can be a program director, it can be a service chief or chairman, uh, it can be uh, a credentialing committee from a prior institution that saws you as fit to practice in this area. It's important that the standards at your institution be uniform, and this is a, an issue you can raise if they're not. In other words, a person whose training path may have been through, say, a medical discipline versus a surgical discipline or radiologic, whatever the case may be, depending on the procedure, should have to meet a similar criteria in order to be privileged. And as it pertains to endoscopy, you need to be aware that one procedure does not make you competent for all. And as I think you're getting a sense listening to the things being done today, even within a given area of practice, upper endoscopy, lower endoscopy, biliopancreatic endoscopy, there will be nuances in procedures that you really need to demonstrate uh, special capability for if you're going to add them to your practice. So the two main pathways uh, to get to the point of being credentialed would include completion of a structured training program such as a residency or fellowship. And this assumes that there's been a volume of exposure, that there's been observed progress towards competence and proficiency. And importantly for the surgeon in the area of endoscopy, this includes that you have built a cognitive and judgment base and not just a technical base. And one of the common criticisms that I'm sure many of you have faced in your institutions that, for example, gastroenterologic colleagues may raise about a surgeon's practice as well. They think because they can get the scope in and out that they're competent, but they haven't developed the discipline of learning the pathology, learning to interpret it, learning to appropriately apply endoscopic therapies alongside their surgical armamentarium. And that's a very important thing for us to step up to. One uh, just rule of thumb for those of you in your learning phase that I found extremely helpful uh, mentor for many of us on the panel today, Jeff Ponsky, uh, he bought us an atlas when we were the fellow and he said, look, there's going to be things that you're not going to see during your fellowship, but you need to recognize when you do see them. And just like we do with surgical procedures, become familiar with that pathology. And I would spend time leafing through that atlas and looking for opportunities to recognize pathology that I saw there. It's a great learning tool that all of us can do. And there are now online atlases that are readily available to you um, to use in that regard. The second way to get competence, and perhaps more pertinent to some of you in this audience, is you don't have time to go back and do a fellowship, you're already through your residency training, and that's to develop competence or demonstrate competence through a second pathway. And basically what you're aiming for here is to show that you've acquired the proficiency and judgment that would be equivalent to that you would gather in a structured training program. If you use this pathway, you ultimately have to measure up to some similar guidelines. You want to be able to show competence in the area. Uh, typically, it will be expected that you will be proctored and or precepted by an unbiased observer who will speak to the credentialing body about uh, your 
your sufficiency in the skill, similar to how a program director uh, might testify for you if you've been through a structured training program. And importantly, there will be an ongoing assessment of this, or there should be, that not only do you qualify as you begin to use the skill, but in an ongoing way, your volume and performance in using the skill measure up to quality measures that are important uh, in patient care. It's important also to realize what numbers a credentialing committee may bring to you, and a lot of this talk is about the number and politics aspect of this whole discussion. And uh, these are the numbers that current societies publish, uh, SAGES, uh, the ASGE, which is, many of us belong to, but is predominantly a gastroenterologic uh, society. Uh, you can see there's some significant increase in the numbers that they expect for uh, basic uh, proficiency or competency. Now, the colorectal society uh, has numbers fairly similar to the ASGs, obviously confined to the lower GI area. And interestingly, the American Association for Family Practice does not have published number guidelines. Perhaps more pertinent to the kind of things you're hearing about in the course today, if you go beyond those sort of basic endoscopic procedures of upper and lower endoscopy and start to look at specific therapeutic issues, these are the kind of numbers that the ASGE has published and which your credentialing committee may discuss with you. And you can see as you get into some of the more therapeutic areas and as you get into the use of side viewing instruments such as you have to be familiar with to do ERCP or linear EUS, the numbers start to, to accrue. Now, I think everyone's aware of the uh, joint position statement that several of the medical GI societies sent out recently, basically uh, putting the American Board of Surgery in the spotlight for what they felt was a lowball stance on the numbers issue. The board issued what I think, and many of you have seen, a truly wonderfully crafted and thoughtful and evidence-based answer. Uh, and uh, I learned last week is actually um, prepared to, to pursue legal action if uh, there's not a retraction. So I think the board has stepped up in this regard, but it highlights how important this numbers issue is, and it's one that we're going to have to face and deal with. One thing I think it's good for us as a matter of conscience to then explore is to say, well, what is the evidence that numbers matter? Uh, if we're going to suggest, as SAGES does through our numbers, that perhaps for a surgeon, the numbers that the GI societies put forward are, are not uh, suitable surrogates for competence. Well, if you look at uh, the data historically, there this was one study that was published a number of years ago and looked at senior surgery residents, PGY4 surgery residents, and GI fellows, and found that to achieve just really what would be very rudimentary levels of competence, 90% uh, esophageal intubation rate, that has nothing to do with retroflexion, seeing well into the duodenum, uh, being able to recognize pathology, just being able to intubate the esophagus 90% of the time, these trainees had to do 100 procedures. And to get to the cecum on a colonoscopy, 84% of the time they had to do 100 colonoscopies. So you can see where some of the number basis starts to develop uh, attraction in the historical literature. If you go beyond that in the gastroenterologic enterologic literature to ERCP, there are studies suggesting that to get uh, what really wouldn't be a considered an accepted level of competence in this era, 85% cannulation rate of the desired duct, somewhere between over 100 to up to maybe 180 cases were required. Uh, and so again, you can see where some of the numbers that we previously showed are coming from. I think a very important study uh, for us as surgeons and for many of you in the audience who are doing endoscopy and thinking about adding on a new, more advanced skill is this study at Gary Vitale and his group at Louisville, uh, and Jerry Larson, who's here at the meeting as well, published some years ago. And they have a fellowship to train uh, surgeons in ERCP. And uh, they found that they could predict how long it would take for their trainees to get to an 85% cannulation rate of the desired duct on ERCP, depending on whether they had prior endoscopic experience or not. If you had prior endoscopic experience, it took about six months, which was about 85 cases in their fellowship. If you had no prior endoscopic experience, that number went up significantly to almost 150 cases in about three to four more months in their fellowship. So prior experience does translate into the learning curve, and that's an important thing to document and has not been adequately factored into some of the other studies that have been published. Perhaps more importantly, as part of the FES project, that SAGES has been involved in, 
uh, Dr. Vasilou and Freed and others of us uh, in a multi-center fashion uh, were part of a study that developed a global assessment of gastrointestinal endoscopic skills for both upper and lower endoscopy as a clinical scoring system. And this is a very important part and a more, it's one of the first validated measures of clinical performance in endoscopy, similar to goals or some of the other tools you may have used in laparoscopy. And basically what her research showed was that uh, if you look at upper endoscopy, the learning curve starts to plateau in terms of performance on this validated uh, gauges tool measure at about uh, 50 procedures for upper endoscopy and at about 75 to maybe up to 90 procedures for colonoscopy. So uh, this is interesting. We need to get more data behind this. This was based on 139 observed procedures uh, by trainees. But I think as this grows, it can start to give us some validated numbers if we're going to enter into the discussions about numbers uh, that will be very helpful as we move forward. I think it's helpful also to be aware that the ASGE guidelines that many of your credentials committees uh, may reference emphasize that their numbers, even as published and perhaps even from some of the things I've shown, uh, what we had, from a surgical side of view might view as somewhat inflated, uh, are meant to be very baseline, very much in the door, threshold levels and that they aren't seen uh, to predict that a person is competent necessarily because they have these numbers, but that these are minimums and thresholds for getting in the door and privileging. I, I think it's also uh, a significant thing that we can bring to the table as surgeons. We've been thinking about this issue of numbers and competence in the non-endoscopic areas of our practice for a number of years. And we've learned some important things there in showing that we're aware of this and that we have a conscience about this in our discussions with our committees is a valuable, I think, incredible tool. We know from Erickson's research on expertise that volume of experience is critical not only to the acquisition of a new skill, but to the maintenance of, maintenance of that skill in practice. And he's shown that across a variety of disciplines, both medical and non-medical, in his research. This has been well published in our own literature with uh, surgical procedures and especially high, high acuity procedures. Many of you have seen articles related to esophagectomy and pancreatectomy, for example, but really across a wide variety of surgical procedures, it's been shown that outcomes are linked to volume. Uh, and many of us uh, have debated the, the merits and demerits of the multicenter VA study that came out a few years ago looking at uh, laparoscopic versus TEP type uh, repairs of inguinal hernias. As you may recall in that study, the plateau where the experience of the provider for a TEP procedure actually became consistent was at about 250 procedures. Now we could argue, but none of our graduates finished with 250 procedures in any area. And as Dick Bell has presented in recent years, uh, his his paper, uh, Why Johnny Can't Operate, many of our graduates in the current era are finishing with truly a handful of procedures in areas that the American Board of Surgery would consider as core areas of competence. So we do need to continue to think about this numbers issue and ask ourselves from what we already know as surgeons how we can best factor that into our credibility as providers in our institutions. Uh, a couple years ago now, the RRC upped the numbers in the United States for expectations in the so-called defined categories for graduating residents. And uh, their numbers, as many of you know, are that uh, the residents need to finish now with a minimum of 35 upper endoscopies and 50 colonoscopies. These are fairly close to the SAGE's guidelines, not too far, far short if you view them as minimums of uh, what the gauges tool is, is telling us uh, we ought to be perhaps aiming for. I just wanted to highlight that while a lot of program directors got a lot of heartburn over this when these numbers came out, in fact, these numbers are pretty similar to what uh, most surgery residents were graduating with nationwide before those numbers were, were uh, enacted. Finally, many of us uh, know about this and think about it regularly, and it may be something that applies to some of you in your practice setting, but rural surgeons in a variety of studies in the United States are often the sole providers of endoscopic care, and this is just one study that showed that the, the predominant procedure volume for surgeon practicing in a rural environment, uh, in this case over 400 uh, such surgeons were part of the survey, 
uh, was in fact in the area of endoscopy. And this is also reiterated in recertification data that the American Board of Surgery collects that shows that surgeons who aren't in urban settings and are applying for their recertification exam turn in their uh, yearly operative log as a preparation for that. In fact, uh, do a lot of endoscopy in their practices. So I, I wanted you to have all that information as you think about how you might factor in uh, what you're learning today into going back to your institutions. I love this quote from Yogi Berra. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. In fact, how do we apply this in our lives and how, when I counsel my residents about how to, how to go forward uh, in getting endoscopic privileges, what are the kind of things that we might talk about? Well, I'm gonna do this in a fairly simplistic way and briefly, but basically, uh, I think the three A's that we often heard in our training, the importance of being able, affable, and available, apply. And I think this able area is actually a very critical one. Uh, if we don't have competence in what we do, we really lose all credibility. So again, I would emphasize here that uh, our trainees need to develop competence in the cognitive and technical aspects of endoscopy and be able to demonstrate that in a way uh, that shows a high standard of care parallel to what we're trained to render as surgeons across the whole uh, spectrum of, of interventions that we offer and that that's the key uh, to being able to be credentialed. Uh, this is a quote I love from John Sweeney. Some of you know from memory, he was having a conversation with Michael DeBakey before his death and he asked him how you develop a practice and Dr. DeBakey's summative comment was you have to have a good product. And I think that's key. If we don't have a good product as surgeons, we shouldn't come to the table. Uh, availability, I would just say as a strategy, think of areas where there's need that you can provide service and often this is the area in screening colonoscopy, it may be areas such as a GI bleeding team at your institution, but there are ways that you can show that what you offer is there to meet the needs of the institution and the patient population and that can be a great way to build a practice. And finally, just being able to do the service component of serving on committees, taking call, uh, doing the things in, in the settings, uh, often our gastroenterologic colleagues don't find it easy to come to the operating room and help us. It's a great area where you can start to build volume and experience, partnering with them in developing new programs, such as in some of the modalities you've heard about today, is also a great strategy. And I would just hold those out to you as ways uh, you could uh, start to build a practice. And finally, I'll conclude with this. Perseverance may be the most important quality. And again, to bring us back to Churchill, I love this quote. Lady Astor, the same lady said, Mr. Churchill, you are drunk. And he said, yes, madam, but you are ugly. And in the morning, I will be sober. Thank you very much.